Welcome back to Mystic and the Nerd here with Jesse DeCourcy. How are you doing, Jess? I'm doing good. It is dark and <laughs> cold. It's the first Christmas in a very long time without snow, so my kids are pretty devastated. Other than that, I'm doing great. How are you doing, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they lived in Australia, they wouldn't know what a Christmas without snow actually the difference. <laughs> they would just go... Okay, that's just a normal Christmas. Okay, maybe we do need to mention how you came here in October <laughs> praying for snow. And I didn't want to break your heart and say that's never going to happen, but I knew it wasn't possible. And then it <laughs> happened. Well, three or four inches happened, not just a not, not just a dusting. I mean, there were maybe some snow angels that happened. <laughs> I won't post pictures, but it, maybe it happened. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> but no snow for Christmas. Good thing you didn't come here for Christmas thinking you were going to get a white one. Hmm. Next year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you bring yeah, the snow. We'll yeah. <laughs> bring the rain. <laughs> bring the snow. <laughs> Well, the mystic and the nerd is back, and we want to carry on a conversation that we started in the video before this one. And we were talking around the places of creativity and how that looked and how God used creation and create, the word create, and we broke that down and then asked Jess, like, what does this stuff mean to you? And she went back to Exodus and then went all over the Bible and helping us understand and expand our understanding of um Create. And we want to go a little bit further today mm -hmm. into prayer. Mm -hmm. So the conversation partners and it grows, um, but we want to help you guys just see what happens when Jess and I start wrestling with something in the kingdom of God and just see where it goes. Mm -hmm. And so we often call these things thought bubbles and what that means that they're conversations that we put out there for people to enter into and engage. It's not about putting down or shutting down. Um, a conversation is actually about uh, just looking for more, playing, seeing what's out there and seeing what we discover. And we've got a few things that we want to share with you. <laughs> How was that for an intro, Jess? That sounded like something a mystic would say as we are seeking some spiritual truths today. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Well, I like that idea of kind of showing the way that we unpack some of these things in conversations, because this is probably hard for some people to track. How did we get from creativity into this conversation of prayer? So I'd like to share with you what happens when you're talking to a mystic like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you ask, you ask the question of how or what creativity does to my faith which the, just the word faith spurred me on into so many thoughts because I've been camping out in my own definition of what is faith to me? What is belief? What is trust? And looking at Ephesians, especially in this idea that faith is a gift and that did lead into some of the conversation we had around creativity also being a gift from God. And then you really threw me for a loop. Because then you just went, oh, I wouldn't call it a squirrel moment, but you, <laughs> you went on another uh, a thought that I hadn't considered. And you said, well, is that prayer? Is creativity prayer? And then I spent probably a whole day just going down <laughs> my <laughs> list of, wow, I've never thought of that in that concept, in that place before. But you have been stretching me a lot in this conversation around what prayer is and introducing a lot of other things into this conversation. So I thought we should circle back to that, share a little bit, maybe bring some of that creativity into this conversation today. But first, I think it'd be helpful to even define what we think prayer is. Like how have we boxed prayer in? What is our traditional idea of prayer before we just really push out the walls on this conversation today? And, see what y'all think so 
why don't you kick us off? Uh, yeah, cool. I'd love to. I think prayer, like often the way it's modeled is our language to God. It's how we speak to God. And when I was younger, we looked for all the right phrases as to how do we address God. So the disciples are curious. They come along and say to Jesus, teach us how to pray. And we get what's called the Lord's Prayer, um, which has been put to memory for generation after generation after generation. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, that's a King James uh, version of it. Most of us don't know what hallowed means. I'll even drop in the word art in there. Um, mm -hmm. is something that we wouldn't normally put in our day-to-day -day language. And so often we then have this nearly religious language that becomes our prayer language to God. And the way that we're often taught is that it's it's like a monologue. God, I'm talking to you. And so in the Lord's Prayer, we have kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it's been done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. Forgive us uh, our trespasses and our sins. And again, a lot of people these days don't even know what a trespass is unless you see it on the side of a farm. It says, do not trespass. <laughs> and you know there's probably bulls over there, so you're going to keep away from that. But we don't normally use that language inside of our day-to-day -day, um, conversations with people. And so for me, when that happens, I want to... Uh, get curious around the words. I want to know why I'm using those words and what those words represent to the people who wrote the words as well. And so often then the concept of prayer that I was taught as a young boy, a young man, was very much the way that I address God. Uh, it would be a one-on-one -on -one conversation often where I would be at home if I did my so-called quiet time, read my Bible, and I would pray. It would be something in my thoughts. I wouldn't necessarily speak it out loud, but it would be something that I'd be engaging in my thought process. Maybe it was something I read from the Bible, and there'd be that language from me towards God. Now, when I became a church leader and a, effectively a pastor, you're praying in front of people which is another dynamic for the whole concept of prayer. So they're no longer thoughts, they're now spoken words. And we're inviting people into that place of my talking to God. And it's that's literally it. And so people are listening to the way that I talk to God. And as a pastor, people will then often model the way that you actually talk because they think that you have this handle on how to talk with God. Mm -hmm. And so prayer, which is, again, the word prayer, I think that's always linked to to God or at least a deity. Uh, so we have this word that points us to a greater being than ourselves. Um, and I'd just be interested in to see even what the word actually means, because again, it's, it's a place of conversation with, yes, a deity, but our deity came to earth dwelled on earth as a man, and in John 15, 15, called us friend. This is where just my world started to crack open in the way that I communicate with God. That's my take on the traditional form of praying. How did I go? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the questions I had and I wanted to ask you was do you think that people often think that they don't pray enough and what are some of the challenges we face when that is it kind of actually reminds me of how we were speaking of people thinking they're not creative or they're not good at creating i i think so often we go oh i'm not good at praying or there's just that same hang up for us so often that we, something gets in the way and yeah. What do you think some of those challenges are in just that mindset and changing that? Well, part of it's a cultural thing too. Like if you're not in a, a church community where it's like, okay, we're going to pray together and we want you to pray out loud. It's a cultural thing inside of church environments where often the people sitting in the pews or the rows aren't the ones engaging with the voice. They're the ones just sitting there going, I'm just waiting for the amen to happen and away we go. But the concept of things like I'm not praying enough I think that's an identity-based um, thought where we have this assumption on what we should be doing for God rather than discovering 
what it looks like to mm -hmm. communicate with God. So I grew up going, I should read the Bible more. Well, how much is enough of huh. reading the Bible? The Apostle Paul comes along with the least helpful phrase in the entire Bible and says, pray without ceasing. Now, for a 14-year-old, it's like, are you serious? Like, you want me to do what? Like, I can't pray for five minutes before nodding off in the morning, let alone praying without ceasing. And that phrase, that, that was one of the keys for me of unlocking what prayer for me actually is and it's not sitting down at the end of my bed having a, a one-way conversation with god and so if, for the main the most of it is that when we start using phrases of not enough or should in our relationship with god we've moved out of the relationship and now we're in that place of distance mm. well what do i need to do to keep god happy or what do i need to do to get god's ear uh, why aren't my prayers getting answered well i don't pray enough or I don't fast enough, I don't give enough, I don't serve enough. All of those things are really unhelpful in the place of any relationship, mm -hmm. let alone your relationship with God. So if you're in relationship with somebody and you're always thinking you're not doing enough, there's a problem in the relationship. Something needs to be addressed. Uh, assumptions or expectations need to be actually put on the table and, and we get to talk about those things rather than continue to operate from that place of assumption. And so just that is the general uh, understanding for me in that place of when people use things like, oh, I don't pray enough, um, it comes back to the, that place of connection or friendship or relationship with God. And what does that look like? What, what does that mean to the person? Yeah. I, I came across an old journal of mine when I was in seventh, eighth grade. And I was blown away because I had captured, I was a young journaler back then as well. I still journal today, but I had captured my process of discovering prayer. But because I wasn't in a church, I was going to confirmation at that time, but it was brand new. And I was going because my friends were there. I was catching up because I was years behind meeting with a pastor and just devouring everything he had to share with me. And in this journal, I would write about the stars at night and how the stars, when I was looking at them, spoke to me something of God. And I maybe didn't have the language to say that that was a prayer. That was me sitting with the Lord and having these moments where my thoughts were directed towards him. But I was in a church around people that were praying, although I didn't feel like anyone was showing me how to pray. So I would go clip out little um, flyers with the Lord's prayer. And I would sit and memorize the Lord's prayer because I thought this is then the way to pray. So instead of kind of this organic relational prayer, I was discovering on my own, you know, out under the stars at night, I started looking at the standards and trying to figure it out, you know, and conform to what people were doing around me. So I think going back sometimes to that more, um, sitting under the stars approach to prayer, not, I, I mean, I think there's multiple forms of prayer. So I'm mm -hmm. excited to have this conversation today to kind of say that, yes, we can do the Lord's prayer. I love the Lord's prayer. I love um, praying as a body and, and coming together in prayer and listening to others pray to God. I love hearing that dialogue that others pray to God and joining with that and joining voices. But coming back to this conversation around more of the creative pieces of prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. You've dropped some revelation on me even further than creativity around love and love as an act of prayer. So maybe let's dive into a little of, of those relational pieces of prayer today and explain what that is to you and how you got there. Oh, for me, most things in the Christian walk, I guess I, I've gone through like a little bit of a reformation in my own world to go, why do I do the things that I do? And what, what do I mean when I'm saying some of the things of creativity or faith or life or prayer or love, like what, what do I mean? And so much of my relationship with God is relational. Well, all of it. It's not at a distance. It's at a presence. It's not 
a monologue. It's a dialogue with him. And I think for the longest time, I didn't understand that he gets an opportunity to talk back and I get to hear him. Because you're taught that God talks, but I'm not hearing anything. And so if I'm not hearing anything, is there something wrong with me? And how do I hear God? And so in the process of me growing and asking bigger questions, I look for how God does the dialogue with us. And people go, well, why doesn't he just speak plainly? Well, sometimes he does. The Bible would record that. And for many people on the planet, uh, having have heard the audible voice of God, and there have been a few times where I've gone, where did that actually come from? Was that in my head? Was that a voice? Did we did we just hear um, a voice then? And it's that place of curiosity where I started going, okay, what does the, the dialogue look like? And that's when I started teaching things like prophetic mentoring, helping people discover God's voice, not just in the Bible, because that's one of the areas I teach, but through vision, through dream, through creation, through their imagination. These are uh, five very accessible uh, places where I think God speaks to us and, and he uses them very powerfully. They're in scripture. It's not as if I'm making stuff up just to go, okay, God does speak through dream interpretation. Mm -hmm. It's right there all the way back to Genesis, how God spoke through dreams. They were interpreted and taken hold of as if God himself was speaking them out, i.e. Jacob. And Jacob is on the run. God awakens him with a dream of that the ladder from heaven, the angels going up and down the ladder. Uh, he, he reiterates the great promise of Abraham to Jacob to say, this is this land's all yours, the descendants are all yours, and Jacob has none of that, zero. But he builds an altar after that because he knows that God's spoken to him through a dream. He didn't question it. He didn't say that was just a weird dream or wondered about what he drank last night or ate last night. He just accepted it as God's, God's voice, and we're starting to see the dialogue both ways. In any friendship that you have, if it's worth anything to you, it's not a monologue. That's not a relationship. A relationship has at least two parties in it where we can hear and listen to each other. Now, you come along to things like 1 Corinthians 13. If you prophesy without love, you're a clanging glock clanging gong, right? Now, I've had people come into my life um, that have been clanging gongs at times because there's no love in that. There's, they come in with a strong voice, but no love. But you add love into the conversation and it becomes a prophetic word that actually then becomes way bigger than what it is. And so this thought about love being a prayer and prayer being love when I'm talking to God, my love for him infiltrates all of the words, the language. There could be frustration. There could be God. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Uh, and there could be anger. There could be joy. There could be gratefulness. There's all of those things. But underpinning it is the love that I have for my creator, the love that I have for Jesus. And so the thought inside of my head was, well, if God is love, then when I'm loving, something of God is actually happening because he is love. He is the essence of love. And I don't differentiate between God's love, man's love, dog's love, um, a love of baseball. Love is God and God is love. He is the definition of it. I don't think John could make it any clearer in 1 John when he says God is love. Jesus is the representation of the Father. And so I just believe that this, this strong concept that the language of the kingdom of God is found in these places of love. So when I love as Christ has loved me, something has been communicated in the kingdom that is bigger than me. It's been like if I'm loving on you and Trev, the kingdom of God is getting bigger in that space. If I love on your kids, bigger again. 
it's that place of prayer that is around the actions of love. Uh, so Jesus says what comes out of your mouth is an evidence of what's actually going on inside of your heart. What a powerful concept that is. And so often for me, I found prayer was like a, a rote thing where it would just be the same prayer each time. And it loses the heart when you're just saying the, the same thing each time or you're looking for the same phrases that other people are using. When you're praying from your heart, it's like the Bible would say about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes there are groans that you there are no words for, but they come out of you. And there have been times in my own life where when you're in crisis, there's you don't even have words to wrap around. How do I actually pray in this situation? There's a groan, there's a cry of the heart and the spirit. And there's been other times I've been so full of joy that there's not enough words. There are no words that give value to the very feeling that I have of being in the presence of such great love. Like even when Trish and I came to America, how many times just did we joke around the concept that there are no words for what we're actually experiencing here? Mm -hmm. So it's transcended uh, an English language. And now it's been communicated, I think, in a God language. So maybe that's the answer inside of that place for me. But my acts of love, my acts of listening to people, my acts of seeing the identity and wanting to help a person discover their identity is me loving, me bringing God into the conversation. And so the dialogue can commence. God speaks through his people. And so often he will use your voice, my voice, Trisha's voice, Trev's voice, as a, a way of communicating to into my world. And when Trev communicates like that to me, there's a conversation that God's having with me through Trevor. These are the beautiful and honoring ways that I think prayer expands beyond the concept of kneeling beside my bed, putting my head down and just giving God um, my monologue conversation for the day. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. So please don't hear me just throwing that out with um, with the, the baby with the bathwater. But for me, I want the dialogue. Mm -hmm. I want to go, God, what are you talking about? Can you let me in on the conversation? Can you share it with me? Can you show it to me? Uh, so often then in community, when lots of people are sharing what they think God is saying, we have an extraordinary dialogue that's actually going on. And that's why I love sitting in these places of community where I'm saying, what's God sharing with you guys right now? To me, that's prayer. Because I'm asking a question. And God is speaking through his people back into my, my will. I think that's my heart for this conversation today is to establish that there's not a wrong way to do prayer. And mm -hmm. for myself and others that I've walked with, I think there's always this fear that you're getting that wrong or that maybe God would be upset if we brought a raised fist or anger. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look in the Bible, lament is a huge part of prayer. Um, that the opposite of prayer is to not bring anything towards God. So whatever our emotions, our emotions or anything that we're feeling, whether it's really positive or just really heavy and negative, we're still bringing that towards him. And I wonder if that's, tying into that conversation around creativity in that um, co-creating with God and the wisdom in the way that our hearts are connecting through creativity and that's working through us. And when we're partnering, I think my response to with is creativity prayer is thinking that when I'm engaging in acting in some kind of art, some kind of creative thing, whether it's relationship, whether it's words or speaking, or even a moment like this, we're creating with thoughts. We're creating with something inside. Our hearts are coming forward. And I wonder if that is that same thing tying into just whenever we're loving one another, it's that same process of examining our hearts and what are they going towards mm. and sometimes that's love and sometimes that's the struggles that we're facing so even when we come together in hardships i think 
that's the place of prayer, just being able to share those hard things with one another. So just looking at some of the concepts in the Bible around prayer mm. as a good nerd today, I was drawn to the Old Testament in the New. In, in the Greek, I like the word, um, I don't love saying, saying it because I can't get it completely right. But it's the pros, I think it's ukame, ukame, pros, ukame. And just the word pros is a movement towards. So I love that idea of engaging with ourselves in others, but we are moving towards God. And then the yukome is more of a um, a sense of praying or desire mm -hmm. or bringing forward our desires or our wishes. Wishes was one that came through a lot. And it's something still disconnecting because I think I probably came into prayer thinking monologue. I'm just kind of giving God, throwing mm -hmm. all my wishes at him. Like, oh, Lord, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this. Um, and I love the idea of the Hebrew word for prayer with tefillah. And tefillah can, can mean prayer, like you said, to God. But it's also an inward examining the word they use often is judgment but it really mm -hmm. comes to looking at our thoughts what's mm -hmm. another one um thoughts our thinking are taking account contemplation but there's a lot of in inner looking and to think that that's a form of prayer mm -hmm. just bringing it back to thinking and processing um, I guess that kind of brings me back to sitting under the stars and just contemplating, thinking, processing, and being able to think of that as prayer. I think there's just freedom in this conversation to know that our prayers, our thoughts, um, taking account, even I'm a big processor. I process a lot. And mm -hmm. probably my husband tends to, to call out some overthinking. <laughs> um, you know, if I can even liken that to prayer today, I'm going to count that as a win. Um, <laughs> so yeah, what is, you know, we, we talked, I think we were tying this into the Psalms, um, and you had some other thoughts around creativity and prayer through, through that, but is there anything else you want to say around forms I love, of prayer? I love those two thoughts, the drawing towards or the inner processing too, because again, that inner processing, like I, I'm an introvert in that way too, and I do process a lot, but that's where I'm most honest with myself too. And not a lot of people get to hear a lot of that internal processing, but I know my prayer header does. And that's part of me working through some of my interactions or reactions inside of a day, maybe things that I'm reading, some of the things that I'm teaching or the encounters that I'm actually having as well. It's that processing part of me that is, it's intimate. Like it's the deep heart space that again, when you're leading a church, you're rarely letting a whole heap of people into some of those those questions or queries you're you're mm -hmm. teaching what you know and inviting people into that place but that deep heart stuff uh, some of that you, you're trying to work out why you think the way that you do or believe that the, the way that you do you know, some of it is the doubts that i've ha held over various aspects of of faith or trying to understand some of the things of the bible it's inside of that place that i'll often wrestle with that and I, that's why i love often going back to the concept of jacob like jacob wrestled with god could wrestling be a prayer mm -hmm. Think about that. What did he wrestle for or a blessing? So what was the blessing? Um, as Genesis would say, it was a change of name. He didn't. He no longer wanted to be called liar or deceiver or supplanter. He wanted a new name and he wrestled with the one to gain that new name. And so you have this thought around the, 
the internal dialogue that we see in scripture is now becoming something that has been expressed and that God steps into that place to communicate with him. I don't know. The idea of wrestling's just come to me and let's see where we go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I really like that. I was, I think I shared this with you. I guess this is another one of those. I was struggling in a season of really wanting to focus on bold prayers mm. because I wasn't seeing a lot of mm, fulfillment in some areas in my life. And I just wanted to make sure that I was aligning myself with God's will <laughs> <laughs> and that if there was anything more that I could do, it was my own wrestling um, with the Lord in this, but just really contending because I really do believe there's something about um being bold in what we are asking. And again, this goes back to my own diving into what is faith, what is belief. Mm. And the Lord brought it back to trust, which took me on a whole journey in itself. But in this bold prayer conversation, I was like, Lord, just show me what is a bold prayer. And he just, in that moment, one of those places where I really felt like I heard him speak pretty plainly, he said, you are my bold prayer. Just like, wait, no, I wanted you to, you know, like your disciples, teach me how to pray. Like, give me the words <laughs> to say. And it's like, what does that mean? I am your bold prayer. But it it just brought it to another place of maybe where I'm still trying. There's still that striver in me trying to find the right way and making sure I'm not missing something that I could be, mm. you know, working with, um, yeah, so I like the idea of, of wrestling too and just um, stretching our imagination today a little or our thoughts around this concept of prayer. I think it's exciting to me. So I had shared with you uh, quickly, I'll just say this, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it some more. I shared that several articles just in my um, time looking up the Hebrew understanding of prayer and really where we see it in the Bible in the Old Testament in several articles actually were saying that there's no command to pray. I wasn't even looking for a command. I was literally just looking for scriptures or verses or the words used for prayer. There's quite a few different ideas of prayer. And what that did for me was just pause because they were making a case that, um, and this was more of a, a Jewish today's contemporary Jewish beliefs saying that prayer is a command essentially, even though there's nothing in the Torah that's really saying that, like in the Ten Commandments, there's nothing mm -hmm. in there indicating that you must, thou shalt pray, you know. <laughs> and I just paused going right, because if if like you're saying in a relationship, if we say you have to do this, or you should, I you know should mm -hmm. is a word that you sit with in this um, um lately. I I really like that prayer is not a command. I think mm -hmm. it's that movement. It's moving towards God. It's something in our heart, connecting or enjoining with him through all these different ways. I agree. And I think it, and you know how I share around the concept of the new commandment I give to you, love others as I have loved you. Well, the Greek in the concordance I've been working with is like, that can be a new way of doing things rather than a new commandment. And I really love that. Mm -hmm. because if I command you to love me, then I just don't know. Like that's a hard place to be in, to command someone to love them, but an invitation to do it, do something new. I think there's wonder in that. I think that there's an ability to be myself inside of that place and allowing that to be a, a relationship that's built on this beautiful beautiful concept of invitation um and so the command to pray i i command you to talk to me jess <laughs> <laughs> like that would go down like a lead balloon right it, it would just like what <laughs> and if trish said to me i command you to talk with me like probably the language is not going to come out of my mouth is not going to be loving and gracious <laughs> because it's not the way that we talk and if you got to the point where someone is commanding you 
Now, again, I'm not disrespecting God's place, God's position in all of this. I'm honoring that, but I also want to honor the language that's been used and why it's been used. And so when you say that there's no um, command for the people to pray, but there's lots of evidence in the Old Testament that people are communicating with God, Mm -hmm. lots, whether it's Gideon threshing his wheat and the angel of the Lord turns up and he has a full on conversation with the angel of the Lord right there, right then, or David and thunders happening in the heavens. And he's like, wow, God's speaking. Trees are clapping their hands. Yeah. God's God's must be pretty happy. These are the things of scripture that we see so often, but it's again, how do the ancients pray? Was it from a command or was it from an invitation? I think when God led them out of Egypt, it was an invitation. Uh, even when they came to Mount Sinai, and the Bible says when the ram swarm blows, they are to come up the mountain to speak with the Lord. And they they freaked out. They said, no, 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 Moses, you're the one going up there, not us. They lost that place of wanting to converse with God in that. And so I, I just love this place that it's not literally a command to pray it's an invitation to talk. Mm-hmm. Walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, what did they do? Well, sometimes when you're walking with someone you love, you don't need words. The presence of that moment is a really beautiful thing to be walking with somebody that you love. It's the same. Is is there a communication happening? Yes, absolutely there, there is. And it's a presence felt thing that, English words aren't being added into. So Mm -hmm. I think there's lots more to this thought than just you shout pray. It's an invitation into that place of conversation. And we're now looking at the format as to what does that look like? And if that's not what I've traditionally learned, is it okay if I uh, explore other avenues of communicating with God? Mm -hmm. I find I, I loved in Habakkuk even there's it was labeled that his song was a prayer. And I was sitting with Hannah's story today, thinking about her prayer to God. And I'll, also as, while you were talking, I was thinking of Jacob's wives. I know that's a really interesting part of um, the Bible, but it's almost like God was listening to their I don't, I don't know if they were actively praying. Maybe they were, but I, I kind of have this sense that you can correct me if I'm wrong, but God saw their hurt or saw their struggles. I mean, isn't that just that inner dialogue that we see through the Old Testament and God is responding to that, which brings mm-hmm. me to that one uh, interesting Greek word I said in today and sent you because it's <laughs> one of the longer ones I've ever seen. <clears throat> And it's in Romans because Romans 8 has always stood out to me. Excuse me. It's late here. (laughs) (laughs) As something so mysterious to me of what is that other way that God, maybe this conversation around prayer, where God's involvement is beyond our understanding. In Romans, it talks about the spirit helping us in our weakness and praying for us. Actually, there's one translation that I read when I'm looking at the inner linear and it says when we're behooved, when we are behooved, I've been seeing that word show up a lot. I just think it's fancy, Um, (laughs) but when we don't know what to pray and we don't even know, and I've had many of those moments where I'm like, God, I don't even know my own heart right now, but I know you do. But what is it that the Spirit's involvement is in this process? And what is this word for help? So I wasn't expecting to find anything exciting, but the word the word for help is so long. <laughs> it's actually three Greek words that feel just like they put it together. And it's um suna anti lambanomai. <clears throat> How do I do Matt? I've been practicing. <laughs> I think you need to say it again, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> soon anti lambonomai lambonomai wow. thank you 10 out of 10 and it means <laughs> help like it's so short i feel like in australia you guys really shorten words 
So I just wonder what, how you would have shortened this in the Greek. <laughs> um, but if there's so much more to this word than help. I loved looking at breaking down some of these words today, but what stood out to me was this idea. Let me find it here because I don't want to put in my own words. I made too many notes on it. <laughs> so it is. Oh, coming alongside of us and taking hold of us. There was even a sense of like taking hold or coming alongside in a really aggressive way. Mm. And there was something in the partnering there that's beyond even our knowledge or understanding that the spirit of God is doing in that. I'm not trying to step on free, the free will or choice or anything mm. here, but I think but there's something here for me that I love to sit in and think about the way that the spirit is coming in those, in those places of prayer when we don't have the words. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. So. Trying to think if there's any last thing on creativity that I wanted to end on today with this conversation. I think the whole thing with creativity is there's as many ways to communicate as there are people on the planet. And so by telling someone this is how they have to pray, you can actually mess with who they are telling someone how they have to communicate. It's again, there's various people in your life, Jess, if they all have to communicate exactly the same way with you, um, it'll quite a, probably get quite funky in those places of relationship. Uh, each person in your world interacts with you differently, connects with you differently, and there's a million reasons for that. And that's why helping a person discover their creativity and it's what the last um, mystic and nerd was about like discovering the wisdom that we carry that becomes the creativity that we then impart every single one of us has a unique wisdom and when it flows from us mm. creativity is often the mechanism or the means of of communicating um, and that's what i love i want to be curious around people who come and to see how they communicate this great wisdom that God has placed within them. And so we see it when an artist paints a painting, we re can read it when a, a writer writes a book, but there's more than that. There's way more than that. And if we're willing to go beyond um, what we've defined as creativity, I think we'll see that our mind does start to stretch into places it's not gone to before. It wasn't that long ago that even use of the imagination in prayer was a challenging place in many people's uh, lives or even churches. And now more and more people are starting to see that that imagination is something God's created me with. And I use it every day of my life. I use it when I pray in words. I use it when I pray in pictures. I use it when I'm being creative. And it's where I think our imagination is such a... Um, like a, a fertile place of conversation uh, with God, with others, and with self. So how much do you think presence matters in prayer? Because as you were talking to thinking of how you, you brought this idea of prayer into a community setting. Mm. So I was able to observe and watch sessions people coming together, many words spoken, many different kind of interactions, everything unplanned and mm. just coming together in unique ways, watching things unfold. And at the end of the session, you would say that was a prayer and you'd kind of summarize everything that had just happened. And I think everyone stood in that place of going, wow, you're absolutely right. That was an entire prayer from beginning to end. I don't know why I'm coming. I'm drawn to presence and how much I think maybe we spend time praying, forecasting. 
thinking of things mm-hmm. to come. I'm actually just speaking for myself or, or going towards things in the past, but I love you. You know how much I love your teaching around love is measured by presence. Mm-hmm. So where, where does that land in this conversation? Yeah. Well, I think the question around presence is how much do you enjoy presence? Like if you're anything like me, it's the thing. Like if you're sitting in a conversation with somebody and they're looking past you, eventually you go, okay, they're not interested in what I'm saying because they're looking beyond the present moment. When you are sitting with somebody who's looking you right in the eyes and uh, engaging with the things you're saying, getting curious around the things you're saying, like that place of intimacy opens up very quickly and relationships can go deep because of that place of presence. With God, I think it's the same. What are you do- talking about today? What, where are you? Like, what can we imagine in that space? And what can I listen to and hear in that place? And so when we're in community, and it was a thought and idea a few years ago around what does prayer look like? Because often you get to the end of a Christian um, meeting and you go, okay, we now have to pray. And it became that thing you should do as to, okay, we're going to pray. What are we praying? Well, we're effectively summarizing everything we've just done as we finish the, the the time of a service. So thank God for the worship and the way that we that you moved through there. Thank you, God, for the way that you spoke to us through the word of God. And we're praying now as we go out into our day and week that we take on board the lessons that we've learned. It's It's a model of prayer that would be at the end of every sermon of every church service ever. But for me, it was like, hang on, God is speaking through all people here. And I have the privilege of listening. And all I want to say at the end of that is amen. And so you're right. I use a phrase like an hour and a half ago, we started a prayer with this and whoever spoke first, I'd share what they spoke. And now here we are an hour and a half later. And the only thing left to say is amen. Mm -hmm. I like that kind of prayer. (laughs) <laughs> and even in this conversation around presence there are moments where we're present with God and it's intentional prayer there are moments when we're intentional and present with each other and that's prayer and there's moments of our awareness that aren't even there that God is praying for us so maybe our entire lives like he said to me you are my bold prayer Maybe that's how that idea is growing for me today. Mm. It's good. This is a typical mystic nerd moment as we process, (laughs) as we process these together. Yeah, I love that. Me too. It's been a joy to hang out with you today. Oh, just just wrestle fun. these things out. Always good. Yeah. Well, we'll see where it goes next. We will. For all you guys watching along, thank you for hanging out with Mystic and the Nerd, uh, Matt and Jess. More yet to come. Love you all. Bye for now. Hey guys, thank you.